So I'm really happy to come and talk to you about building a life with WordPress. Um, are there any freelance um, developers, designers, people who use WordPress for their business in here? Awesome. Cool. Hopefully, um, I'm going to give you some tips that I learned from a bunch of other really smart people about how to do that um, in a way that doesn't suck <laughs> um, for you. So first things first, um, there's a hashtag for you if you want to hashtag this talk in particular, WP Freedom. And if you want to follow along with my slides, um, you can go to carvel.me slash WCPDX2015, uh, and my slides are up. All right, so freelancing or building a business can, can often feel like you're kind of out at sea, especially when you first start out. Um, I know that when I got started, I had this idea in my head that someday I might like to work for myself and do freelancing, but I do not have a business background. Um, there's not really any entrepreneurs in my family, uh, and I didn't go to business school. So uh, except for that one freelancing class that I took in college, um, I really had no idea what I was doing. But I had met a lot of people who also didn't really have any idea what they were doing, and they were doing really well. <laughs> so, um, and I was helped along by um, getting fired from my job. So I had the catalyst of like, okay, maybe that means now I'm, I'm supposed to do this. So you kind of just, I started like going to WordPress meetups and, and looking for clients and um, not charging them very much and, you know, working a lot of long hours and stressing about money and um, all those things you do kind of when you're new. <laughs> and, um, and then I started following... Um, some people who actually make it their business to sort of help people out who are in that position, who are um, struggling, trying to figure out how to do this, um, and have really put together some systems to kind of teach people, hey, here's how you can um, systemize your business and, um, and make a little bit more money and have a little bit better quality of life. So one of the biggest obstacles is um, to, to raising your rates and to sort of really putting yourself out there and growing your business is your mindset. Um, if you have the mindset, as a lot of beginners do, that, oh, I, don't, I can't really charge that much because I don't really know what I'm doing, um, I don't know as much as this other person, then um, it's going to be really hard to sort of project that what you do has value and it's going to be really hard to get paid well for it. So that's one of the, the biggest obstacles. And then the other thing that mindset affects is this whole idea of um, commodities versus value-driven mindset. So what do I mean by that? Commodities is, you know, anything that is in mass quantity that you can sort of get everywhere, right? <clears throat> I mean, WordPress developers are a dime a dozen. You can get that anywhere. Um, you can go on Upwork or Odesk or whatever they're calling it now uh, and find somebody to slap together a site for you. So how do you compete with people who are you know sort of doing a race to the bottom and maybe charging you know five bucks an hour, ten bucks an hour? How do you compete with that? Well, you do it with a value-driven mindset, um, and you have to bring more to the table in order to make that work. So, a commodities-driven mindset. You might talk to your potential customers about things like WordPress and plugins and widgets and gravity forms um, and blogs and you know all this sort of technical stuff that a lot of us get really excited about because it's cool, right? But most um, normal people who aren't technical <laughs> don't really care about that stuff. They care about you solving their problem. So you know, with a value-driven mindset, you might talk to people about their goals, their business goals. What are you trying, what are you trying to do with your business? Where do you want to get to? What's your revenue right now? What would you like it to be? How many visitors do you want a month? You know, you want to talk to them about strategy. You want to talk to them about tactics. How are we going to grow your business using online marketing? And the minute that you start to talk to people that way, chances are that no other developer or designer before you has actually talked to them that way. And it instantly elevates you above 95% of the people that they're talking to. Because now you're not just, you know, code monkey who's gonna like put together some widgets for them. You're a partner in their business and you're there to help grow their business. So it makes a huge difference. So 
One of the things that I learned about is um, something called the Lean Canvas model. Has anybody read um, the Lean Startup? Of course, Chris has read it. We know you've read it. <laughs> um, so this model comes from Lean Startup. Um, and basically, it's a tool that kind of lets you um, think about your business you know, sort of from taking a step back um, and, and looking at you know, what are your goals, what's the actual market that you want to serve, what is your unique value proposition that you bring, what are the problems that you want to solve in your business, and what are some of the solutions that you offer. So it helps you, and it's, it's a one-page sheet, and it really is meant to be you know, a short exercise. So 20, 30 minutes where you really think about all these things and sort of map it out um, to see if, like, is this something I want to pursue? Is this something that I want to focus on? So you're going to define your solution. You're going to choose your channel. What do, what do I mean by that? Do you want to serve uh, small businesses? Do you want to serve enterprise businesses? Do you want to just work with mom and pop shops? Do you just want to work with artists? Like, what is your market? What's your, your niche or niche? Or I, don't, I never can figure out how to say that. <coughs> And then you're going to figure out, you know, do the people that I want to serve actually have money to pay me because that's important. You want to get paid. So here's the worksheet. And actually, if you go to the slides, I've got links um, in here to a printable version and a Google Doc version that you can um, fill out and play around with this. All right. So when people ask you, what do you do? Um, what do you say? What do you, what do you say? Yeah. User experience designer who tries to make technology usable for people. Awesome. Um, I know that I used to say, like, oh, I make websites. Because, I mean, that's true, right? I do make websites. Um, and some people are interested in that. Um, and some people you know, want to hear more about that and know what that is. But that's kind of commodity-driven way to say what you do, right? I, like, there's a lot of people that make websites. Like, what kind of websites? Who are they for? Um, and so once you kind of figure out what your, your unique value prospect is, you can kind of change the language around how you talk to people about what you do. So now I tell people that I help businesses get more customers online without being overwhelmed by technology. Because then that speaks to a problem that a lot of people actually have. Like, oh, I know I need a website, but I don't know the first thing about domains or hosting or WordPress or, you know, Anything that's going on. And the first time I sort of developed this, this elevator pitch, which you're all free to, free to steal, by the way. Um, it's open source. Um, <laughs> so you know, I, I did my lean canvas, and I came up with this pitch, and I went to a meetup. And, uh, and I tried it out, and every head turned. And they were like, what? What? We, we, need, we have problems. We're confused by technology. We need that. You know, and it's a way to start a conversation um, that's focused on you know how you can actually help people. All right. So um, another thing that kind of changed everything in my business was learning about something called the interaction model, um, and that is: does anybody here um, hate selling? Okay. Well, of the people who raised your hands that you hate selling, uh, do you like helping people? Okay. And of the people who like helping people, have you ever bought something, um, a course or a product, that really, really helped you? OK, so a lot of hands are still coming. So it's possible that you can have a product or a service that you get paid for that really helps people. So that's something that can kind of change your mindset about um, selling. And then the interaction model can also help with that. So relationships are interactions over time. That's all they are. So let me, let me just pause for a second and ask, who has charged $2,500 for a WordPress website? OK. Who's charged 5000 Who's charged 10000 25 Two hands. Three hands. Four hands. 30 A couple hands. OK. So if you want to raise your rates, then you have to start providing more value for people. Now, I don't know about you, but my selling process used to be that you know someone would come to me and say they were interested in having a website. And I'd say, great. Um, I might have them fill out 
a form on my website, you know, tell me about your project. Um, I might get on the phone with them or meet with them over coffee for 45 minutes and then say, oh great, okay, I'm gonna, I'll get you a proposal for that um, and a price. So do you think that someone is gonna pay you 10,000 or $20,000 for a website when you've spent 45 minutes with them? Probably not. <laughs> so you have to, in order to provide more value, you have to know more about their problems and you have to build trust and you do that by building a relationship and relationships are just interactions over time. So here's a little like Cliff Notes model of the, of the interaction model. So the first interaction is a cold call. Does anybody get sort of like PTSD or chills at the idea of cold calls? Okay. A cold call is not necessarily sort of the traditional uh, thing that you're thinking of where you're, you're sitting at your desk thinking, okay, I'm gonna make 100 calls today to like people out of the, well, not the phone book, but the internet, um, that don't know you uh, and are probably gonna hang up on you, right? That's, that's kind of what people think of when, when we say cold call, right? A cold call is actually just uh, a new interaction with somebody that you've met before, never met before, right? So, hi, what's your name? Catherine? Great, I'm Carando. What do you do, Catherine? Accountant? Awesome, I'd love to hear more about that. Tell me, uh, so how much does it cost to like hire an accountant? Depends on what you need done, okay. So that's a cold call, right? We've never met, we're just talking, you know, talking about you know, what we do. And if I'm interested in what she has to offer, then I might start asking more questions. Well, well, how much does WordPress website cost? You know? So your only goal in a cold call, a cold interaction, is to schedule your next interaction. That's it. Somebody says, oh, oh, I need a website. Great. Why don't you uh, give me your card or let's whip out our phones. Are you free next Wednesday at two? We could totally have a 20 minute call and see what it is you need and see if I might be able to help you. Does anybody here think they could do that? Just say, hey, that's great that you're interested. Let's schedule, let's schedule time to talk. Is that like doable for people? Yeah, okay. So, interaction two. And this is something that, especially if you're new in your business, is, might be a foreign idea for you, is a qualifying phone call. So you're gonna spend 15 or 20 minutes on the phone with somebody, and you're gonna decide if you want to work with them. You're gonna decide if they are right for your business. Not everybody is right for your business. Not, um, you're not gonna be able to help everybody in the best way. And I know as, <laughs> As a new freelancer, uh, I literally, the first client that I ever got, I knew within five minutes of talking to her that I was going to fire that client as soon as I could. <laughs> you know, but you're new, right? You have to say yes to everybody. But just keep in mind as, you know, something to progress toward that you want to get to the point where you actually decide the people that you want to work with. Because those, are, those people, when you have determined that those people are a good fit, you know that you can help them, you know that you can knock it out of the park, those are gonna be your raving fans and they're gonna refer you more people and they're gonna be better to work with and they're gonna pay you on time. Like think about the best client that you have right now and then make it your goal to make every client in your business be that client. Like why should you have to put up with, you know, the deadbeats who are like, oh, I'm waiting on this to pay you or, you know, whatever. So you're gonna decide, like, do you wanna work with them? So you might ask them, you know, if you, if you don't like working with startups and somebody calls you and says, oh yeah, we got this great idea and we're a startup and you know, we're trying to get funding, you'd be like, mm, nope, nope. You know, maybe you like to only work with businesses who are at least five years old, uh, who have you know, 10 employees and are doing you know, $500,000 a year in revenue. Like, you're gonna figure out what your ideal client is and then when you talk to people, you're gonna figure out like how, you know, you, you could make a scorecard and figure out, you know, does this person match my ideal client or are they close, right? So that's the first phone. So now, instead of like, you talk to them for five minutes, you schedule an hour meeting, you do a proposal, now you've spent, you know, maybe a total of less than half an hour with this person, just deciding if they're right for your business. And if they're not, then you could save all the time you would have wasted on somebody else who might be a better fit. All right, so the next thing is discovery. 
So discovery is where the magic happens. That's where you build the relationship. So now in my business, if people want to work with me, I say, great, here's my process. If I decide that you know, maybe we might be a good fit together, great, we're going to do discovery. And that's going to be a series of you know, three, four, or five meetings where we talk about your business. We talk about what your problems are. And we talk about who are your customers? Who are you trying to reach? We talk about what market you're in. We talk about your competition. What tactics are they using? We talk about what have you done before and what, has it worked or has it not worked? And if people aren't down for this, if they don't want to do it, well, then they're not right for my business. Because how can you really give somebody a good solution if you don't understand all their problems? And it's, it's just like going to the doctor. Like, you don't go to the doctor and say, hey, my, stug my stomach hurts, I need an operation, <laughs> right? Like, you might think that, but what you do is you go and you tell the doctor your symptoms, and then, you know, she runs a bunch of tests, maybe, and then comes back and says, okay, I think, you know, this is what you have, and these are your options of what we're going to do about it. And that's what, that's what you need to do in your business. So the next three meetings, and because you're having lots of interactions over time, you're building a relationship with that person, and you're building trust with that person. And you're providing value just in discovery, because a lot of business owners don't have the time to actually sit down and think about, you know, people, you know, even when I send them to the, the worksheet, you know, on my website, and they're like, oh, what are my goals? You know, like a lot of people aren't even sort of clear on what it is they want to do. And so just you taking the time and making the space for them to think about that and plan that and figure that out is valuable. And a lot of people actually charge for discovery, which is even better because now you're getting paid for your time because this is a lot, right? This is a long sales process than probably what some of you are used to. So you can get paid for that time and it can sort of act as you know a trial run, right? So if at the end of discovery, maybe you've seen some red flags, you're not maybe sure if you want to work for this person, you can say, hey, here's your proposal, here's what I think you know, the solution to your problem is, um, but I don't think I'm the right person to do this for you. But now they have a proposal, they have a plan that they can take really to anybody um, and have them build it. So lots of, lots of cool things about discovery. So then, You've spent time with someone, you've delved in all the problems, and you're going to present your solution because you want to make sure that you actually understand what it is their problems are. You know, it's, it, any uh, good active listening involves sort of like repeating back what you heard and making sure that that's actually what they said. And that's the time, too, when they might say, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you about this other thing, right? So you present your solution and you say, look, okay, based on what you've told me, you know, you have this issue and this issue and this issue, and um, here's what I think we should do about it. Here are the strategies and tactics, and here's a ballpark of what I think your investment might be. And then the next thing is to actually give them a proposal. And if you take nothing else from this workshop, here's the single most important thing that I've learned this year, Stop emailing people proposals. And if you want to take a picture of that and tweet it out and tag Brant Weaver, <laughs> um, stop emailing proposals. Because what do people do when they get a proposal email, email or they get it on paper, and especially if they're talking to a bunch of other people, right? They just like scroll down and they look at the price. All right? And now you're, now you're competing on price with whoever else they're talking to. So. If you show up and you present your proposal, now you get to talk through all of the problems that they told you about, which you have now put into their proposal. Oh, you told me about this problem. Here's the solution. Here's what the investment will be. Right? And you're telling them a story. People are hardwired to respond to stories. You're telling the story of their problem, and you're telling them the story of what you're going to do about it and what life's going to be like after you solve their problem. So once you've presented that, now even if you end up in a stack with other people, right, they're going to look at your proposal and they're going to think back on how you took the time to delve into all their problems and how you took the time to show them um, everything that you're going to do to solve their problem. All that's going to come back to them when they look at your proposal, but not if you just email it. All right, so present your proposal in person. 
and this is tough, like, especially when you first um, start doing it, you know, even in my mastermind group of people who've been, you know, sort of living this stuff for months and months, she's like, oh, they just, they really wanted me to send it over, and I said I would, and we're like, no, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> All right, but what if you are weak, and you emailed it, <laughs> or you're just hearing this today, and you emailed someone a proposal yesterday, and what do you do about that? So this is a little bonus that I like to call the anti-follow-up. I learned this from Troy Dean um, of WP Elevation. And the anti-follow-up is, have you ever, has anybody ever done this? Like, you email a proposal, and then you're like, did they get it? I wonder if they got it. Oh my God. You think they read it? I wonder if they read it. And you're waiting, and you're like, your bank account's getting low, and you're like, man, I hope they say yes. And so you're like, should I email? I don't want to bug them. I don't, I don't know. And so maybe, maybe you wait like three or four days or a week, and you're like, hey, did you get that proposal? Right? That's not, that's not a good feeling for anybody. You don't want to like chase people, and people don't like to be chased because it's not attractive. So the anti-follow-up is, all right, you sent them the proposal. And maybe every three or four days, you're just gonna send them like a little nugget of cool information that's gonna be useful for them. Hey, Steve, just wanted, saw this great book about you know, business and totally thought of you. Hope you find it useful. Hey, Martha, um, you know, I know you were confused about like how the whole SEO thing works and I found this really cool audi um, article on Moz and this is like how I learned everything that I know about SEO. Cheers, right? And everything that you're doing by doing that is just proving to them how much value you bring to the table, right? And so you can do this for, you know, usually over maybe two or three week period, just dripping, and you can put this on your autoresponder, right? You can, you can put this in MailChimp or ActiveCampaign or whatever, you can just like queue it up to go out automatically. And if they haven't, you haven't heard back from them by the end of that, then you can call them up or email them and say, you know what, look, hey, my production schedule is totally filling up, so um, if you wanna get in, I just need to know your decision and let me know, right? You're busy, even if you're not busy, you're busy. Okay, <laughs> and you've got things to do, and if they want to get in, they need to, you know, they need to get in. And people respond to scarcity, right? Oh, I'm gonna miss out, right? So, um, so that is a little bonus uh, that you can do. Um, I just added that value drip, I thought of that, so. Um, all right, so the secrets of the interaction model. You're gonna become selective about who you work with. Right? Not just anybody and everybody is right for your business. So you're going to start, you know, putting some filters on that. That's, that's instantly going to make you more attractive, right? I mean, I'm at the point people are like tweeting me and saying, oh, so and so needs a WordPress developer. And I'm like, yeah, I'm actually kind of booked. Um, it's like if you're booked, you must be really good, right? Like, nobody goes to the restaurant that's empty. They go to the one with a bunch. I, I went down to Hart this morning for, to get my coffee, and across the street at Tasty and Alder, there was literally a line curving around the block. Like, why, why would that be? Probably because their food is really good. <laughs> so you're going to become selective about who you work with. Um, this is something I forgot to mention earlier, but when you're doing this discovery with people and you're scheduling these meetings, you want to always schedule your next meeting before you leave the meeting that you're in. Because now you're on their calendar, you don't have to worry about it, you're going to meet again in another week. You're not chasing them to try to get on their calendar. So that's another thing, probably the second most important tip besides not emailing your proposals is start scheduling your next meeting. If they say like, oh, well, we have to meet with the board, you know, and talk about our budget for next year, and that's not gonna happen for, you know, another four weeks, just say, great, let me get on your calendar in like five weeks. Are you free, you know, beginning of January? Let's just put something on the calendar, we'll check in, we'll see where you're at. Done. All right, and stop emailing proposals. If you get nothing else, <laughs> don't, just don't do it. Um, so 
Those are kind of the things that, the major things that have like made a huge change in my business this year. Um, and everything in this talk I learned from a lot of smart people, a lot of really successful entrepreneurs. And if you go on my blog, which I put a short link here, carvel.me slash everything I know, I actually have a blog post that is everything I know about running a small business. Um, and I learned it in part from these people. So Brent Weaver, um, who runs yougurus.com and 10K Bootcamp, uh, Troy Dean, who runs WP Elevation, and Brennan Dunn, who does a class called uh, Double Your Freelance. Um, and so I'm gonna thank them, because they've, they've, you know, I've purchased things from them and learned things from them that have totally changed my business and my life. So um, hopefully I've passed some of that on to you, um, and I'd love to talk to anyone about anything that I said today. And I just squeezed in the cat at the last minute. <laughs> wow, thanks, Karanda. I think you did a presentation better than Brent Weaver. <laughs> um, you said you weren't taking any questions. I think we're early, though, so. So uh, we I have will. a few minutes. Does anybody I don't have any questions? I promise to have answers, but you can ask me questions if you want. Yes. Let me get this over to you. Hold on. It seems like some of what you're doing also falls into what some people might describe as content strategy. And I wondered how deep into the brass tacks with that you get, or if you ever refer to yourself as you know, content strategist as well, or if that's kind of wrapped in in this um, as you describe yourself now. Um, I, I don't really describe myself as a content strategist, but maybe I should, because that is, I do talk a lot to clients about that now, because I kind of think that's everything. <laughs> Um, and I'm trying to start doing more of that in my business, right? There's the whole cobbler shoe thing. Um, and so, like, you know, I'm like, oh, you need to be using email marketing and you need to be, you know, and I wasn't doing any of that. And I had thrown up, you know, a landing page, but then wasn't, wasn't actually emailing anyone. And so I was like, okay, I have to set a good example. And so I really committed, you know, in the last month to doing once a week, new blog post, email newsletter, um, and, and I got the best compliment ever, actually, the other day from a friend of mine. I saw her in person. She said, it took me three weeks to figure out that you weren't emailing me personally. I was like, yes. Uh, <laughs> like, that's what you want. That's why you spend time, you know, figuring out, like, who your audience is, is so that they feel like you're talking to them. Um, so maybe I'll add that to my description because it, it, like marketing is really content strategy. It's figuring out, and you can tell, like once you start thinking this way, you can tell you go to websites where they're like, we make the best widgets and we've been doing this for a hundred years and, blah, and you're like, I don't care, like solve my problem, you know, versus, you know, the sites that you go to where it's like, uh, well, I think I actually put this uh, in the, my blog post from last week where it's like, there's one uh, exterminator site where it's like, any pest, any time, schedule your, your appointment today or whatever. It's like, yeah, that's what I want. What, what kind of pest do you do? Any pest? Okay, cool. Oh, and any time? Great. Great. What do I do? Oh, I'm supposed to schedule. Okay, great. Like, just, like, no. And then, you know, there's another one where it's, it's like a wall of text. <laughs> You're like, what am I supposed to do? So I think content strategy is super important. And, and you know, as I've been learning more about marketing, like, and, and I'm a writer by inclination, um, so I'm trying to make my job involve like, more of that. So maybe, one, maybe I'll tack it on. One back here. Hi. Um, this may hit on what you were talking about, but I find I'm a, I'm a graphic designer and kind of new into WordPress, but do, how much time do you find you spend working with clients, and maybe you don't have clients like this, but I find I do, who don't know, I mean, they're not good at supplying you content to throw up there, so, I mean, how much of the writing are you doing? How much are the, well, we need photos for this, I mean, are you going out, are you taking the photos? Are you writing it for them? Or are you kind of expecting them to pitch in and do that? Or do you end up waiting like 10 years for them to do anything? That's my um, problem. That is an awesome question, and actually, um, this week's blog post is about content and why clients should not be writing their own content unless that is in fact their profession. Um, because I'm trying to educate, I'm trying to educate people, right? I, I'm trying to sort of create the clients that I want who understand that. 
Right. No, and a copywriter doesn't necessarily know everything about, you know, accounting or whatever your business is. They talk to you, they interview you, and then they craft that language. But their their specific expertise is to use words to get people to do things. <laughs> Like, that is probably not your expertise if that's not your business. And so I have, you know, written some content for clients. I have waited forever for clients to give me content. I'm, try I'm slowly trying to transition to a point where it is just sort of expected that you're going to pay for content, you know, at least some of it. Um, and so the, and that's an education process, right? Like, this is this is sort of simple but also sort of complex there's a lot of moving parts and and you know the course that um that ed mentioned is because you know i get i get clients who i'm like okay give me access to your you know to your site so we can get started and they said oh my other developers set that up i don't know you know they literally don't own their domain or their hosting and the first thing i have to do is like wrestle it away from whoever has it and i say you know you wouldn't let your real estate agent sign the papers for your house. It's your house. They don't get the keys. You do. <laughs> so, um, so even if they're not technical at all, like they still have to understand that. So, constant educational process with clients, including about content, um, and I'm and getting. It's I'm making progress, and that I'm, people are paying, especially for professional photos, which is huge. Um, and so that's a it's an ongoing battle. Um, a good rule of thumb is, oh, um, she's asking about is there a good resource to, resource to figure out like fee structure, like what you, what you should charge people. Um, and I would say that whatever you're charging now, you should double it. <laughs> and then, you know, as you learn more, your rates should continue to go up. And it is difficult to, to find that. And one thing that's helped me a lot is to get into mastermind groups. Um, where you talk about, you know, what Brent calls a, the back of the house stuff, right? Like you can get into the nitty gritty because it's a, it's a private group, it's a closed circle, um, and we tell each other things about like what's really going on, uh, including pricing. And so a good, I, I would say the best resource for that is to find some other people who do sort of what you do and, you know, that have trust and, and start talking about it, but also to just continually raise your rates. Because the more you raise your rates, in general, the better clients you're gonna get. Anybody else? Yeah, oh, one second. Just to follow up more from some of these things about the other things clients need, I mean, I find so often you just start peeling the onion that really the website is the least of their problems. Right. And by the time you're done with discovery, it's like you're at their house installing a new router because they can't <laughs> even get on the internet. So, I mean, how much, where's that balance with negotiating them? Yes, we can build you a website, but really we need to talk about what are you even going to do with it because I don't think you have a marketing goal in mind. Right. Well, and that's that's the brilliance of discovery is because it's not just about a website anymore, right? Like online marketing, the website is the like ground zero. Like you have to have, and, and again, if you go on my blog, um, I have a, a blog post about the hierarchy of web needs, right? And the, the bottom rung is you've got one <laughs> and it works and it's decent looking uh, and it's mobile friendly. Like there's this baseline tier, right? But that's just the beginning. And so, where you create value and getting get into like the 10k and up projects is because you take the time to find all those problems and you know educate the client that okay yes you need a website but you also need an online marketing strategy and that might involve building a sales funnel and creating lead magnets and you know doing content marketing and all that kind of stuff Um, well, there's two things, there's kind of two ways to approach that. You could, you could do it in phases, right? You could say like, okay, if this is your budget, let's get you, you know, maybe your website is terrible. I'm working with a company right now. Like, they have one of those websites, like, that somebody's nephew built back in, like, 1998 or whatever. Like, it would be better if they didn't have one at all. Like, that's how bad it is. 
Um, so if their baseline is like getting a website, like great, like take the 15 grand and get them a website, <laughs> you know, like get them, get them to level one. Um, and um, it might be that, you know, if you uncover all these problems for them and show them like, if you want a site that actually brings value, that actually like gets you customers, this is what you need to do, they might go find some more money. So, but like get them, you know, as long as, as long as a project that you want to do and it's profitable for you and they're giving you a good rate, like it doesn't have to be everything at once. Hi, uh, I love your tip about uh, not presenting, you know, not emailing your proposals, but uh, a lot of times I get contacted from people from uh, out of state, like on East Coast or Midwest, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times I don't really have that, you know, opportunity to, to go present in person. Uh, do you have any tips on There's that? There's this awesome thing called Skype. <laughs> um, Skype, Google Hangout, we have the technology for this and, I, and like a lot of my clients are Chicago, um, like not, not local and even if they are local, I, sometimes I just don't want to leave the house and I'll just be like, let's, <laughs> usually not for a proposal though, if they're local I will go and see them but, um, but you know, then if like I, I have standing weekly meetings if I'm in a project with somebody and those I will often do just on Google Hangouts um, and so, yeah, so it doesn't mean you have to physically be with them, just like you can get on Google Hangout and screen share and say this is all, and then once you've done that then you can email it over and they can read it. Yeah. We got time for one more question, so. Deborah. Uh, oh, wait. No, just, I guess she called you out. <laughs> you can come find me after. Thank you. Um, so I guess one thing that I found is that um, I feel like I have, I mean, maybe you hear this a lot. There are two kinds of clients, but because um, I feel like there are many kinds of clients, but I find there are two in this regard, which is those who are used to the discovery process and consulting and have that built into their timeline and their budget, and those who don't and who've never even considered it and who don't have a budget for that. And mm -hmm. so I guess my question to you is how do you push forward with that? It might be something that they're open to in the future or whatever, but they just have not built that into their budget. So what's your take on that? Um, I will shorten discovery for smaller projects. I will make it maybe two meetings, but no fewer than that. So literally, if someone can't or won't do discovery, then they're not a good fit for me. Um, so, I mean, that's just a line in the sand that I've drawn, and I have so many horror stories from myself and from my mastermind group of like, oh, we just, we thought we knew them and we shortcut discovery and then terrible things happen on the other side and it just, it's just not worth it. And, you know, as you are starting to try to implement this as a brand new thing, it may feel weird and hard to find the people who, you know, will go for it. But if you, if you draw the line in the sand, like, the thing is, like, the more you sort of put yourself out there and tell people what you're about, the more you will draw the right people to you. So like I had somebody at the Ada Developer Academy, she's like, yeah, I follow you on Twitter, my personal Twitter. And she's like, do you have trouble getting clients? <laughs> like, Cause some of y'all follow me on Twitter and you know. Uh, and I said, no, I said, I had somebody, uh, you know, there's a little field that's just like, how did you find me? And he says, oh, I saw you fighting on Twitter. So uh, I went and read your blog, and I was like, oh, cool, I need a WordPress developer. Like, the right people will come to you if you draw that line. I drew a line that I was like, I can't deal with GoDaddy anymore. So, you know, you will either switch to a different provider or you'll work with someone else. And, like, nobody has approached me and said, like, I really need to stay on GoDaddy, but I really want to work with you. Like, nobody says that to me. I just find the people who are right. So, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Fernando.